welcome to The Code Tray, the podcast of the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMEDPRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the Libraries Entry section of the ACCP Communities website. And we're going to look at the article, The Effect of Intravenous Push and Piggyback Administration of Ceftriaxone on Mortality and Sepsis. Ultimately, this article attempts to answer the clinical question if the administration method of intravenous antibiotics has an effect on more the mortality rate in sepsis. So our objective today is to determine the difference in 28-day mortality between intravenous push and intravenous piggyback. So some abbreviations that are going to be used today include IVP for intravenous push, IV piggyback for intravenous piggyback, um, as well as some other commonly used ones, and then finally SOFA being the sequential organ failure assessment. So when thinking about the logistics regarding IV push versus IV piggyback ceftriaxone, there are a couple things to keep in mind. So IV push is recommended to go over three to five minutes, but as we know in practice, you know, sometimes nurses push it faster than this whereas an IV piggyback administration is recommended to go over 30 minutes. IV push, additional equipment required, uh, it will just be they can either come in pre-mixed files or some type of nurse admixture, whereas an IV piggyback, it'll either be pre-mixed bags or there's sometimes a compounding requirement. So IV push has minimal additional equipment required, so everything that, you know, is typically stocked in emergency departments, so things like flushes, uh, needles, syringes, and things like that, whereas an IV piggyback typically requires some sort of drug delivery pump recommended, you know, sometimes in the nick of time. Sometimes an IV piggyback is hung against gravity, but it's recommended to be hung um, with a drug delivery pump. So some common IV push beta-lactams include ampicillin, cefazolin, cefotaxime, cefuroxime, ceftazidime, cefotitan, as well as mirapenem. So the Surviving Sepsis Campaign does put an emphasis on time to antimicrobials and re- provides a recommendation that administration time of antimicrobials should be less than one hour in patients where sepsis is considered definite or probable. And the guidelines also recommend that in situations where sepsis is possible, antimicrobials should be administered within three hours. Each hour delay in administration of antibiotics is associated with an increase of in-hospital mortality in septic shock patients. In patients without shock, the time to antimicrobials have been shown to have less of an effect on mortality. So now we'll look at some of the previous studies surrounding IV push versus IV piggyback antibiotic administration. So the first study did compare IV push to IV piggyback beta-lactams and found that IV push beta-lactams did have a higher incidence of adverse reactions. The most common adverse reactions were shortness of breath, there was even infusion-related reactions as well. The second study compared the time from sepsis diagnosis to antibiotic administration for the IV push group and had about a 30-minute time reduction compared to the IV piggyback group. And then the final study we're all, I'm sure, familiar with, this study that was published by Kumar, is a multi-center retrospective review trial. So looked at the survival to hospital discharge and looked at the intervention that basically looked at antibiotics that were administered after a patient had sepsis-induced hypotension ultimately found that each hour delay and initiation of antibiotics resulted with a 7.6 increase in mortality rate. So now digging into the study. So this was a single center retrospective analysis that was done between March of 2010 and February of 2019. Patients were divided into two groups, the first group being an IV push group, where the IV push was administered over two to five minutes, and the second group being the IV piggyback group, where IV piggyback was administered over 30 minutes. And the remainder of the sepsis care was based on the survival of sepsis campaign guidelines and ultimately up to provider discretion. So when looking at inclusion and exclusion criteria, the patients had to meet the septic and or septic shock criteria. The unique thing, so because this trial was from 2010 to 2019, the definition of septic and septic shock changed in March of 2016. So here you can see the initial definition was based on the second international sepsis definition consensus. And then from March 2016 to 2019, it's based on, you know, sepsis three. So 
you know, sepsis is defined as a SOFA score greater than or equal to two, and then septic shock is defined as persistent hypotension that required vasopressor medications to maintain a MAP greater than or equal to 65 despite fluid resuscitation. Some other inclusion criteria that patients had to be initially treated with ceftriaxone and then as well as receive a neg negative allergic skin test. And I did put an asterisk by this because while this was not listed in the inclusion criteria, if patients had a positive allergic skin test, they were not administered ceftract. Um, other exclusion criteria, known pregnancy diagnosis, any patients that refuse life-sustaining treatment, patients with missing data, or transfer from an outside facility. I um, won't we'll get to it, but the transfer was actually a pretty high number of patients in this uh, because the, the site for this study a very large tertiary care center that did receive a lot of transfers from smaller hospitals. So when looking at the primary outcome, ultimately the primary outcome was the 28 mortality rate after admission to the emergency department. Some secondary outcomes were ED arrival to antibiotic administration time. They determined if antibiotics were administered within one to three hours of presentation. The administration of appropriate antibiotics, and the study did define appropriate antibiotics, so it was kind of a two-step thing. So step one, uh, it was considered appropriate if the bacteria that was cultured was susceptible to ceftriaxone, and then if there was nothing, no bacteria identified in cultures, it was considered appropriate if the Stanford guidelines did recommend ceftriaxone for the indication of the sepsis. Other secondary outcomes included the presence of septic shock, as well as the rate of hospitalization in an intensive care unit. And then for safety outcomes, they looked at the rate of adverse reactions. I do want to note that this study really defined their adverse reactions as what we would commonly refer to as allergic reactions. I mean, really didn't report some of our, you know, GI side effects and stuff like that that might be reported with other studies. So statistical analysis, so continuous variables were tested using the student's t-test or the Wilcox rank sum. Categorical variables were testing either using the chi-squared test or the Fisher's exact test. Survival curves were plotted using the Kaplan-Meier method. And a multivariable Cox proportional hazard regression analysis was used to determine the relationship between administration method and 28-day mortality. So almost 4,100 patients did meet exclusion criteria, but only 939 patients were actually enrolled in this study. So that's why there was, like we said, there was a very prolonged enrollment time, especially with the volume of this hospital. So the most common causes for exclusion were patients who were transferred from another hospital, if ceftriaxone was not used, and if patients were refusing aggressive management. And then of the enrolled patients, almost 300 were in the IV push group and 640 were in the IV payback group. And one thing that's interesting about this is that it was not stratified. So even though that it looks like it's about a two to one ratio, this was not done at all by the investigators, but this is actually based on how the hospital practices. So generally speaking, baseline characteristics between each group was not statistically significant for a difference. But we did have some notable differences. This would be our baseline SOFA scores, initial lactate, systolic blood pressure, and heart rate, all favoring the IV piggyback group. As you can see, the initial SOFA score was one point lower in the IV piggyback group. The initial lactate was lower, initial systolic blood pressure, and then initial heart rate were also lower in the IV piggyback group. So this is probably ultimately uh, driven by the SOFA scores. So as you can see, the components of the SOFA score include things like platelet, bilirubin, mean arterial pressure, glass and coma scale, renal function, and stuff like that. When looking at between our blood, urine, respiratory, and body fluid cultures, microorganisms were only were identified in almost 60% of patients. So the most common organism that was identified was E. coli that was found in almost 30% of all patients. And then this was followed by Klebsiella, um, which was identified in almost 15% of patients. And the streptococcus did make up about 10% and staph aureus about 6.4%. One thing to note is that the study did not have any results on susceptibilities or rates of resistance or anything like that. So it's definitely a limitation. So when looking at the primary outcome, the mortality rate was about 12% overall. You can see the IV push group had a mortality rate of 12.7%. IV payback group had a mortality rate of 12%. So this result was not statistically significant, as you can see by a p-value of 0.851. And this also is not a clinically significant reduction in mortality rate. So some of our secondary outcomes, so looking at median administration time, of course, this is statistically significant difference. As you can see, there was about a 26-minute difference between the two groups. The rate of adverse reaction, there was only one noted adverse reaction in the IV push group, and there was no noted adverse reactions in the IV piggyback group. 
appropriate with antibiotics. This was not statistically significant. It could be about 5% difference between the two groups. Septic shock, there was no difference there with only a 3% difference in the groups between septic shock. And then ultimately, it was identical ICU emission with both groups having an ICU emission of about 29%. So now when we're looking at the Cox personal hazard regression analysis, comparing sepsis or septic shock, there's a couple things listed here that really have an effect on mortality. So these things like initial SOFA score, infection sites, intra-abdominal sites, so things like that do have an effect on the uh, Cox personal hazard regression analysis. But then ultimately, uh, it's not what is not significant is the difference between IV push versus IV piggyback. And then we're looking at the Cox personal regression analysis. So we're looking at septic shock specifically, whereas the other one looked at septic or septic shock patients, you can see it's the same thing. Certain things do lead towards less of a hazard ratio. So this would be like urinary tract infections, intra-abdominal stores, stuff like that. As you can see, there was no difference between our IV push and our IV page draft group and the Cox regression analysis when looked specifically at the septic shock patients. So even though, you know, that to say, overall, what I wanted to kind of pull from these two Cox personal regression analysis is that there's no difference between the IV push and IV payback group in mortality and sepsis or septic shock. So this does bring us to the discussion. I think there's definitely a lot of things that we can talk about here. So the authors concluded that despite the faster time to administration, overall, there was no difference in 28-day mortality. They also noted that there was no adverse effect difference between the group you know, we'll get to later, but that's definitely a limitation, though, of the adverse effects that they looked at. Some other limitations that the authors did note is that this was a single center retrospective study, and that a majority of patients did receive other antibiotics along with ceftriaxone. So it would be hard to specifically say that ceftriaxone, not only ceftriaxone made a difference in the mortality rate, but that the difference of administration in ceftriaxone made a difference in the mortality rate when patients were receiving such other, other forms of therapy. And then this was a limitation, and the authors also did not report what other antibiotics were used. So some critiques that I have about the methods. So there was no power analysis performed to determine enrollment numbers. And like I talked about, right, so it was almost a nine-year enrollment, and it, it, this was, you know, a very large hospital. And it took them that long just to enroll about 900 patients. So I definitely think that that's, you know, something to keep in mind. And then like I talked about earlier, so enrollment based on route was not stratified. You know, ideally, we would like to see this being a one-to-one instead of how it kind of played out to a two-to-one. And then all patients did receive an allergy test prior to receiving ceftriaxone, which is really why their adverse event rate was so low, not only because they didn't report some of the common adverse effects, GI side effects, and stuff like that, but they really, what they identified as adverse effects or reported as adverse effects with things that we commonly think about as an allergic reaction. And if you do an allergic skin test before receiving triptraxone, then you will have less rate of adverse reactions. And really, that's really just not feasible in practice, right? So in, in, in a disease state like sepsis or septic shock, where time to antibiotics really does have an effect on outcomes, it's really just not appropriate to get an allergic skin test on patients before we give antibiotics. Another thing to keep in mind is that the minimum age was 73 years old. This is a very old patient population. There was one participant who was under the age of 65. Uh, but other than that, you know, everyone else was over the age of 65, median age of 73, um, which is actually surprising with the older age. And we'll get to it is that the mortality rates were pretty low compared to some of our other studies. And there was a statistical significant difference between ba- baseline SOFA scores. Having that difference could indicate that our IV push group actually maybe had, a, had slightly worse sepsis. And then, like we talked about, so other aspects of sepsis management were not reported. You know, things like vasopressor requirements, uh, things like the amount of fluid that was administered, anything like that really wasn't reported, which, as we know, are main drivers that affect the outcomes in septic patients. If they could have illustrated that, you know, the difference between the two groups was nearly identical with other aspects of sepsis management, I think we could pull more from this study but when we really don't know how these patients were treated outside of their ceftriaxone route, it's hard to say that this has any impact on mortality or anything like that. And then looking at the primary outcome. So there was, you know, like we said, so there's no difference in 28-day mortality in the groups. And there was a 12.7 IV push and 12% IV payback. And overall, that's a pretty low 30-day sepsis mortality compared to previous trials in literature. So SOAP 2 quota mortality rates around 50%. And SOAP 2 uh, also only had a median SOFA score of 9 compared to the study that had a median SOFA score of 7. So once again, a slightly, you could say, sicker patient population that we see in a landmark trial, SOAP 2, 
So that's just some things to keep in mind. Maybe these patients, you know, weren't as, uh, as acute as maybe populations that we see today. Looking at some secondary outcomes, so the median time from ED arrival to initiation of antibiotics was 176 minutes, which is crazy to think that this was almost three hours that it took to receive antibiotics in a patient that presented with septic or septic shock, when as we know, guidelines recommend, you know, within one hour if sepsis is probable or shock is present, and then within three hours if sepsis is considered possible. And I think that a big thing why their uh, delay time to initiation of antibiotics was so long is because they were doing the skin testing on their patients as well. And then, like I talked about, right, with this allergy pre-screening, there was only one adverse event that was reported due to allergy pre-screening. So ultimately, what is the conclusion that we can get out of this study? So I kind of split into two things. So I'm thinking about what impact does this have on clinical practice, right? So there's kind of two trains of thoughts, right? So you could say with no difference in mortality, IV piggyback will limit the amount of nursing time that's required, right? So if nurses do the, the IV push the appropriate way, they'll have to be at bedside, you know, pushing an uh, antibiotic for three to five minutes. Whereas theoretically, you know, if the supplies is available, IV piggyback by the time the nurse spikes the bag, hangs it, and, you know, put programs the pump, uh, the nurse could walk away at that point um, and wouldn't have to stay with the patient. But then some also things to keep in mind is that IV push does not require any additional equipment. And in RED, there's definitely a, a shortage of pumps, right? Especially if there's a lot of acute patients that are requiring multiple pumps. You know, it could be that, you know, we have to move pumps around from room to room and stuff like that. I'm sure, you know, isn't just at our institution, but a lot of EDs, especially now, you know, post-COVID, how crowded EDs are. Also, IV push can be administered in triage. So at our facility, we do not have medication pumps in triage because theoretically patients should not be in triage long enough to receive an antibiotic, you know, piggyback. But an IV push, if IV access is established, theoretically, this IV push can be administered in triage because it shouldn't take longer than five minutes. So looking at future considerations, I think that, you know, an, a multi-center study in patients with higher SOPA scores really could maybe help capture patient population better. I think that really with these lower SOPA scores, which then in turn went to lower mortality scores than we typically see in our septus patients, it's really hard to kind of extrapolate the study into current practice. And I would think that also comparing IV push to intramuscular ceftriaxone would be something good to look at. I think that if Intramuscular ceftriaxone, theoretically, it could be excess. It could be administered within, you know, a minute of the patient firing for sepsis. As long as the supplies are at hand, you don't have to get IV excess, anything like that, you know, could potentially, I think, you know, be interesting to see if that has an impact on practice. So I think ultimately, you know, I'm, I don't think an institution should swing one way or the other. I think there's definitely pros and cons to both. And I think ultimately it should just depend on nursing staff and kind of how the flow of your institution runs if IV piggyback should be continued, or if maybe this trend to IV push should be continued. So I would ultimately like to thank my mentor on this, uh, Dr. Lisa Hayes. Thank you for all the help on this um, and really helping guide me through this. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club Presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal healthcare professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.